Hi guys, uh, this is uh, Jonathan Lambert from Maths and Stats uh, and this is another video in our series of videos dealing with calculus and limits and in particular epsilon delta proofs uh, and what we're going to consider here is to use the epsilon delta definition of a limit to show that the limit of this rational function x over x squared plus 1 as x tends to 0 is in fact equal to 0. Okay? Uh, let's maybe just recall the definition, the epsilon delta definition of a limit. So let's just recall. So we call uh, that what the what the epsilon delta definition says. It says this. It says that for each and every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that for each and every x satisfying satisfying the following condition, uh, that zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a, and a is where the limit is tending to, uh, being less than delta, okay, that this implies that f of x minus l okay, uh, is less than epsilon. Okay? So the goal is to find an appropriate delta that uh, such that uh, to find an appropriate delta uh, that goes along with for every epsilon greater than zero, uh, that this premise is true uh, implies this particular conclusion. Okay? In this case, okay, in this case, what we'd like to show is for each and every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that for each and every x satisfying the condition that zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a, Okay, that's where the x is tending to, it's tending to zero, and must be less than delta, that that implies uh, that the absolute value of the function, which is x over x squared plus one, minus l, which is minus zero, okay, and it needs to be less than epsilon. So in this particular case, don't forget we have a premise, okay? And we have, so here's our premise of our implication, and here's our conclusion, okay? And what we'd like to do is to find some delta so that when this is satisfied, that this implies this thing here. And like in all of our previous examples, uh, what we'll do is we'll start with the conclusion because the conclusion is where we want to get to. And the conclusion is in terms of epsilons and also x's. So let's see, can we reduce the conclusion down into something that looks like the premise? Because if we can do that, well, then what we'll be left with is something that looks like an appropriate delta. So let's have a look at this. So in anticipation, in anticipation okay, of finding an appropriate delta, finding an appropriate an appropriate delta, let's consider let's consider the absolute value of f of x minus l less than epsilon. Okay, so we're going to consider this. That is that is we're considering the absolute value of x all over x squared plus one minus zero is less than epsilon. Okay, now we know what that reduces down. Uh, this just reduces down to the absolute value of x over x squared plus one. Uh, and keep in mind then that the absolute value of a quotient is the same as uh, the quotient of the individual absolute value. So this now reduces down to b. So this implies that the absolute value of x all over the absolute value of x squared plus one must be less than, must be less than epsilon. Now, what we'd like to do is we'd like to get this into this particular form here. But just think about it, that the absolute value of x is the same as the absolute value of x minus 0. So let me just do that. I know it's a bit redundant doing this. But this is the same as x minus 0, the absolute value of x minus 0 all over the absolute value of x squared plus 1. Must be less than, must be less than epsilon. Which implies that the absolute value, which implies, that implies, doesn't it? That implies that the absolute value of x minus zero must be less than the absolute value of x squared plus one times epsilon. So we sort of reduce it down into this particular form here. Okay? But unfortunately, the delta that we could choose, this particular delta here, is in terms of epsilons, which, we, which we'd like. But it's also in terms of x squared plus ones. And I suppose this isn't, this, this number here isn't defined unless we know what the actual x is, if that makes sense. So what we're going to do is this, is that like in all of our proofs, we're going to restrict, we're going to restrict the, we're going to restrict the premise, okay? We're going to restrict the x minus uh, zero. Uh, we're going to consider uh, 
when we're very, very close to that particular value, okay? So in other words, when we're very, very close to zero, let's say we're within a unit of one from zero. So we're going to restrict x minus zero, the absolute value of x minus zero, to be less than one. And we're going to explore to see what happens. To see, can we understand anything in relation to the x squared plus one? So what does this, this implies that minus one must be less than the absolute value of x. Oh, sorry, whoops. This implies that minus one must be less than x, which must be less than one. Now, what we'd like is from this particular this particular identity here, what we'd like is to be able to figure out what is the situation with x squared plus one. Hmm. So let's think about this here for a moment. Yeah. So if x is between minus one, if x is strictly bigger than minus one and less than zero, well, then if we square the x, this must imply that, well, first of all, from an upper bound perspective, that the x squared must also be less than one. But this time, if I square a negative number that's, let's say, bigger than minus one, but let's say less than zero, I'm also going to get a positive number that's less than one. That's grand. But the other possibility for the x is that it's actually zero, because zero is within that interval. If I 